Warning, even though this video is about a series of movies that are geared towards children, this video is not for kids. It's going to deal with a lot of intense subject matter, so if any of these things make you severely uncomfortable, I suggest that you do not watch this. So I think that this requires a little bit of context. I was at work one day and my coworkers were talking about the Minions. And somebody brought up that the Minions were basically a ripoff of the Three-Eyed Aliens from Toy Story. And I joked about how the Three-Eyed Aliens are cooler because the Three-Eyed Aliens are basically a doomsday cult. Naturally, this was followed by a lot of awkward silence and stares, to which I had to elaborate. Well, think about it. They all wear identical uniforms, they have an intergalactic inspired space background, and they have an obsession with a giant claw taking them away and ascending them to a better place. And in a very messed up way, it reminded me a lot of the infamous Heaven's Gate cult. God dang it, I swear to God, I don't have an obsession with thinking of incredibly dark theories to correspond with children's movies. But since you're here and watching this already, let me try and humor you with my explanation. In Heaven's Gate, all of the members wore matching space uniforms. Their whole religious belief system was fueled by science fiction and pop culture. And they had a fixation with alien life forms taking their souls and carrying them off to a better place. And because I have a very warped sense of the word fun, I thought it would be fun to make a video that critically examined this. So let's find out. Do the three-eyed aliens from Toy Story qualify as a doomsday cult? He has been chosen! Oh hey, what are you doing? Stop it! Stop it, you zealots! Because I'm not a professor or an actual expert in this field, there are going to be three main cults that I'll use as reference throughout this video. Heaven's Gate, the Branch Davidians, and the People's Temple, which I know is not a doomsday cult, but we'll get into that later. Let's start with Heaven's Gate. And I want to give a last warning to turn back if these things make you uncomfortable. Even though I want this video to have a lighthearted and fun tone, this is the part where we talk about a very real, gruesome, and disturbing tragedy. In 1974, Marshall Applewhite and his partner, Bonnie Nettles, founded the Heaven's Gate Group in California. Together, Applewhite and Nettles, known to their followers under many names, including Doe and T, began spreading their bizarre ideology that there were signs of extraterrestrial involvement in Christian theology and created a whole new dogma based around this. This radical dogma believed that the earth was going to be recycled by these forces and the followers of Heaven's Gate would rely on a spaceship called Tela, which would carry all of their souls into the next level. Doe and T's twisted New Age version of an afterlife. After Nettles died from liver cancer in 1985, Applewhite became increasingly more unhinged. His major fixation was on the arrival of the hale bopp Comet, a once-in-a-lifetime event that Applewhite believed was going to signify the date that they were ready to ascend to the next level. On March 26, 1997, the bodies of all 39 members of Heaven's Gate were found dead lying in cots, everybody wearing the exact same clothing. A patch for their away team, which was in fact a reference to Star Trek, and a pair of Nikes, so that way their bodies could be properly identified and their souls could rise. A mass suicide so bizarre and catastrophic, it's still remembered over 20 years later. And then there's Toy Story. And the lingering question, do these guys qualify as these guys? Well... Claw is our master. Claw chooses who will go and who will stay. I have been chosen. Farewell, my friends. I go on to a better place. Actually, no. <laughs> See, in order to be a doomsday cult, your religious belief system has to include an actual doomsday. An advent, some kind of apocalyptic event that would trigger something like a mass suicide. Heaven's Gate had the hale bopp Comet just like the Branch Davidians believed in the opening of the Seventh Seal. See, the People's Temple and Jim Jones weren't doing this because of some religious advent. They did it as a warped act of political resistance and Jim Jones was a drug-fueled maniac. So not every cult involved in a massacre is a doomsday cult. The three-eyed aliens aren't focused around a specific event. They're just waiting at the mercy of the claw. But their behavior is still somehow odd and culty. Maybe they aren't specifically a doomsday cult. Maybe they are a death cult. A cult fixated around the idea and obsession of death and the afterlife. Um, except in the second movie, Mr. Potato Head totally saves their lives and then they become his kids and clearly they value life. So, um, 
what are they? Not including additional source material from the Buzz Lightyear cartoon show, because that'd be a whole other thing. But for the sake of this silly little video, how do you classify the belief system that they have? While pawing around for research for this, I came across this Top 10s article by this guy Jim Siskel, and he proposes that the aliens actually practice a form of totemism. Totemism is basically the belief that a group has a religious and spiritual relationship with a sacred animal or object. While typically with a wild animal, it could extend to relationships with like trees or nature or other different objects. Which brings the question, can you have a totemic relationship with an inanimate claw? Well, you're literally dealing in a universe where you have inanimate toys that are somehow alive. Maybe these creatures perceive this claw as some sort of organic material, rather than the people that are controlling it. And maybe from their perspective, that makes the claw an animate creature, and not necessarily a machine. Now, while it's cool and interesting to look at it as a form of totemism, really the three-eyed alien's belief can be boiled down to plain old idolatry, the belief and worship of an idol. They're just so obsessive about it that their religious extremism can be misconstrued for something much weirder. So there you have it. It was just some odd real-world parallels. Of course, it would be so silly to assume that the three-eyed aliens were a cult. Because we all know that the real cult in Toy Story was the Roundup Gang. Oh, you want me to explain that one? All right. If you're with me this far, and if you're willing to follow me down a very bizarre rabbit hole, all of this was just a preamble. Here's the real video, an in-depth exploration of the dark secret theology of Toy Story. So I want to set some ground rules before we get too far into this. This video isn't meant to be a statement on real religion, but rather an examination of religion in the context of Toy Story. See, whether it was intentional or not, Pixar made a really interesting world dynamic in the Toy Story series, specifically in the role that children play. Think about it like this. All that the toys in Toy Story want are to be adored and played with by their children. They love these children. They basically worship these children. I think it's really safe to say that in this universe, the children in Toy Story basically play the role of these great deities, or gods, which I will kind of use as shorthand. Again, not god in like the creator myth sense, more like a demigod or a deity or a very powerful entity that these toys want to appease. If you think I'm crazy, rewatch the first Toy Story and replace every time they say Andy or Kid with God. That'll be a really fun Friday night. And regardless of whether or not you think gods exist in the real world, in Toy Story, they're real. They play a very active part. But unlike our world, there's an interesting role reversal. In most real world religions, God is looking down on us. God is aware of everything that we're doing, and we aren't aware of anything that God does. But in Toy Story, this is reversed. In Toy Story, the toys are the ones that are observing and aware of the gods, and the gods lack complete awareness of what the toys are doing. Isn't that kind of neat to think about? Siskel's article cites this as an example of dystheism, the idea of an indifferent god that is neither good and not evil. In this case, I don't think dystheism is the quite proper term, because these gods aren't unfeeling, they're just ignorant. Unawareness is different from unfeelingness. They still do love the toys, they just don't realize that the toys love them back. Siskel's article inspired a lot of the latter half of this video, so I want to give him a huge handful of credit. Of course, there are some things that he says that I think are completely ridiculous, like the idea that Mr. Potato Head is a Mormon, but we'll get into that in due time. Starting from the beginning, let's try and take a look at these movies from a theological perspective. In Toy Story 1, Woody is Andy's favorite toy. He's the most devout and the most beloved. There isn't any trace of Woody's backstory which gets brought up in Toy Story 2. Rather, his whole identity is devoted to being Andy's number one, his favorite deputy. If you watch this movie, you realize that he doesn't question a single decision that Andy makes. 
doesn't matter how much we're played with. What matters is that we're here for Andy when he needs us. That's what we're made for, right? Except, of course, once Buzz Lightyear enters the picture. Buzz Lightyear is much more attached to his false identity as a space ranger than his literal identity as Andy's toy. Since we're examining Toy Story in the context of religion, one can't help but compare the idea of um, Buzz Lightyear's belief that he is some sort of intergalactic savior to the Church of Scientology. What are you talking about? Right now, poised at the edge of the galaxy, Emperor Zerg has been secretly building a weapon with the destructive capacity to annihilate an entire planet. I alone have information that reveals this weapon's only weakness. And you, my friend, are responsible for delaying my rendezvous with Star Command! You are a toy! Only in the sense that they're both belief systems that were mainly fueled by science fiction. So, after Buzz's arrival, Woody is straight up forsaken. Like, literally, if you look up forsaken, this is the definition. His whole world got turned around, and Andy, his god, had abandoned him. This leads to a struggle between Woody and Buzz that actually does a pretty fine job of paralleling the story of Cain and Abel. The two go on a series of adventures, and they end up trapped in Sid's room. And Buzz is confronted with the fact that his entire backstory and belief is a lie. So he attempts a literal leap of faith to prove that he's a space ranger, only to end up completely broken, metaphorically and literally, leading him to drink beyond the point of comprehension in a scene that honestly feels pretty straight at home in a Sartre play. And all of this is some pretty heavy stuff for a G-rated movie. Also, I forgot about the parts where they made a shout out to Alien and The Shining. All of this is in a kid's movie, you guys. The villain of the first movie is Sid. Sid is this sort of mad god that's dedicated to destruction. He turns all the toys around him into abominations for his own amusement. In the context of this theology, Sid is almost like a minor Lovecraftian deity. <laughs> yeah, I just said that. So in the end, Buzz realizes that even though he isn't a space ranger, he can still be a hero. And even though his whole world has fallen apart, he finds the strength and will to make his way in this new one. Woody also makes his own realization that he can share Andy's love with Buzz. And that pretty much wraps up Toy Story 1. Well, I'm not going to say they live happily ever after, because we're about to head into Toy Story 2, and this is where things start to get really dark. Toy Story 2 is really a meditation on a lot of things. It was Pixar's first sequel, and Pixar probably tried to make the greatest sequel of all time by paying homage to one of the other greatest sequels of all time, The Empire Strikes Back. No, Buzz. I am your father. No! And like Empire, this movie is significantly darker in a lot of ways than the first one. Specifically, it has to do with trauma and cult recruitment. Toy Story 2 begins with Woody receiving a traumatic injury, one that makes him reckon with his mortality and his relationship with Andy. Later on, he gets abducted and winds up in the company of the Roundup Gang. And yes, they deliberately made that shot as terrifying as possible because the premise behind these characters is actually really frightening. They reveal Woody's secret significant past. They made him feel special and important. They made him feel like he was some part of a bigger plan. They said they were going to take him to a far off paradise where they would be worshipped and admired forever. The only catch is that they'll be in a display case the whole time and never get to talk to any of their friends and family again. Now, call me crazy, but... Doesn't that sound almost exactly like what we just dealt with with Heaven's Gate? Maybe without the aliens, but if you replace the plane with the spaceship and Japan with the next level, you can see that Pixar set this up as a direct way to mimic how cults work. See, the real leader of the cult and the person who has the most to benefit from all this is the prospector. By the prodigal son has returned. The Prospector actually has the perfect profile for a cult leader, and oddly parallels the life of infamous cult leader David Koresh. See, David Koresh was born Vernon Wayne Howell. He was a dyslexic rock musician who couldn't get any gigs, ended up joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and rose to power before creating his own radical offshoot of it, the Branch Davidians, changing his name from Vernon to David Koresh. 
Stinky Pete, the prospector, was always portrayed as a bumbling oaf. To Jesse, he's only known as the prospector, but in the past, he was called Stinky Pete. Like David Koresh, this name change was a way of assuming a whole new role. Now, because of the Roundup gang, he could have a chance to finally mean something. He didn't need any other god but himself. Fair? I'll tell you what's not fair. Spending a lifetime on a dime store shelf watching every other toy be sold. Luckily for Pete, all of the other members of the Roundup gang were the perfect example of people who were susceptible to joining a cult. Contrary to popular belief, cults don't look to recruit crazy and unstable people. They actually look to recruit very stable people who are incredibly emotionally vulnerable. This vulnerability can sometimes come after serious trauma or tragedy. Tragedy like Woody's injury or how Jessie has severe PTSD after being abandoned by her owner. This movie takes Jessie's PTSD very seriously. No, can't go. I can't do storage again. I just can't. Jessie, Jessie. I will go back in the dark. And again, pretty shocking that this is all in a kid's movie. So with no family and nowhere to go back to, Jesse and Woody were perfect targets for the prospector's manipulation tactics. The prospector does a great job of using love and affection to induce inner guilt and make them stay. And to me, this is some of the coolest plot writing that Pixar's ever done. How long will it last, Woody? Do you really think Andy is going to take you to college? Or on his honeymoon? Andy's growing up, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's your choice, Woody. You can go back, or you can stay with us and last forever. You'll be adored by children for generations. Yeah, I'm having a hard time not hearing that as something really culty. And then, like all cult manipulators, what starts off with love and affection eventually turns into brute force and coercion. Look, we have an eternity to spend together in the museum. Let's not start off by pointing fingers, shall we? I also love how the prospector likes to maintain his mint condition purity and ends up getting sentenced to live with a little girl who's going to draw on him. So Woody initially declines Buzz's help for rescue, then realizes even though Andy's eventually going to leave, that's still no reason why he shouldn't try and be there for him now. Then there's a lot of big chase scenes, an epic moment where Woody saves Jesse from the very vessel that was going to take them away, and then more members are added into Andy's fold, perfectly setting up the stage for Toy Story 3, aka the movie with Teddy Bear Satan. And now we're on to the final chapter in the book of Andy. And there's a really interesting morose vibe that's over the whole thing. Now again, in the mythology of the Toy Story world, these gods aren't immortal. And this is what happens when a god sort of a moves on. Will never die. All the toys start off abandoned, and while Woody ends up in the hands of a new owner, the other toys end up at Sunnyside Daycare where things are being run by a giant pink teddy bear named Lotso. While Lotso seems initially kind and warm and welcoming, in a shocking twist on the Pixar formula, he turns out to be a bad guy. And why is he a bad guy? Well, his owner literally cast him out. Once a being of love is now a being of scorn and hate. This fallen teddy bear sounds a lot like a certain fallen angel, doesn't it? Now, because this is the internet, you all probably assume that I was referring to Freaky Deaky Alistair Crowley Baphomet Do What Thou Wilt Satan. But I see Lotso as more of a Miltonic Satan, and his whole arc really mimics the idea of Paradise Lost. Now having been scorned by humans, if he can't have love, nobody can. As the infamous quote from Paradise Lost goes, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Okay, yeah, you know, it's not that exact quote, but it's the basic idea. And the Caterpillar Room at Sunnyside is actually a really good version of hell. Think about it. You have these giant monstrosities ripping you apart limb from limb, all while all the toys in the next room enjoy a nice quiet playtime. That, to me, seems like some genuine hellish torture. Unlike the Prospector, there's no real overarching plan to what Lotso is doing. He's literally just inflicting suffering for the sake of creating more suffering, so that way all might feel like he does. 
If your kid loves you so much, why is he leaving? Really, out of all the villains in the Toy Story franchise, he's the most twisted. Then in the finale, which happens to be around a giant fiery pit, if you've been playing the Switch Kid for God game, this one's a no-brainer. Push it! Where's your kid now, Sheriff? And when all hope is lost, when these characters who we've known for over a decade are about to face oblivion in its purest, hopeless form, and literally the devil himself is winning, what saves the day? Oh yeah, that's right. We just went full circle back to the start of the video. And that stuff was planned. Believe it or not, it's a literal deus ex machina, a god out of the machine. In this case, it's the three-eyed aliens god, the claw. And what happens to Lotso? Hey buddy, you might wanna keep your mouth shut. <laughs> a fate pretty much befitting the Lord of the Flies. We're now at the end of this video, and I wanted this to be more than just a series of stray observations. And I think that if you look at Toy Story through this lens, you actually see a different light on what these movies are about. Grace. In every movie, these toys come up against huge, life-changing events that they can't really do anything to prevent. All they can do is affect how they handle it. Like Andy getting a new toy, or Woody realizing that Andy's going to grow up to Andy actually growing up and leaving them behind. What do you do when your entire purpose for existing doesn't need you anymore? Well, you find your own little ways and you handle it through friendship and you handle it through finding a new purpose. And it's about being open-minded that there are more solutions than what you initially thought of. At first, Woody was ridiculing the idea of the claw. This is ludicrous. Jokes on him when it actually saved his life. In the beginning, I think the clouds in Andy's room painted a very deliberate image of nirvana and heaven. We end the same way that it began, with a blue sky and a kid, and a bunch of toys that are ready to be played with. I wanted to get this video out before the fourth one came around, because I grew up with these three movies, and I wanted to get my thoughts out on them before this new one came out. It's interesting how each movie has covered a different aspect of toy life so far. The bedroom, collecting, preschool... This new one seems to be looking at what happens when you make toys and carnival games, so I'm interested to see how that pans out. Either way, looking back, these movies are just freaking perfect. They're original, they're smart, and honestly have a really beautiful and uplifting message. And as a reminder, I'm not trying to say that this is some sort of religious conspiracy. I'm just saying that Pixar are darn good at what they do, and you can find amazing patterns when you look at the way that stories are weaved. And thanks again to Jim Seisel for writing the article that inspired most of this video, and Kevin McLeod, the god of web royalty-free music. If you like this, you should check out some of our other stuff. We have another crazy film theory that is more successful than anything I will ever do ever again, and a really cool mini series called Too Kawaii for Comfort that actually just got a shout out from ProZD. This is Rhino Stew, and I hope you have been humored.